Tonight, anger and incomprehension. I just want to say to my son that thank you for being my best friend. A grieving BC community says goodbye to a bullied teenage boy. The message his family hopes to share across Canada. I will govern for all Canadians. Andrew Scheer says he opposes reopening debates on abortion or same-sex marriage. Will it be enough to blunt liberal attacks? We have over 30 cities that we monitor here in Canada. And why allergies in urban areas are on the rise. Think male trees, concrete jungles, and climate change. This is The Net. Sorrow and sympathy were overwhelming today as a 14-year-old BC boy was laid to rest. The circumstances around Carson Kremeni's death are heartbreaking. But all that compassion comes too late for a boy who just wanted to fit in. His family believes he died from an overdose and that older kids got him dangerously high for their own entertainment. This is bullying that led to murder. Just over three weeks ago, Carson was late coming home, so his grandfather, who mostly raised him, went out looking for the boy. He was struggling for air. And found him here, being attended to by first responders. When I found him in the park, he was still breathing. But uh, he was laying on the cement all by himself in the middle of the park in the dark. And they couldn't save him. A series of photos and videos showing his ordeal have circulated on social media. One caption read, Carson almost died, LOL. And they're just uh, laughing and taking videotapes. The story has stirred outrage and disbelief, especially since no arrests have yet been made. Tanya Fletcher brings us the emotion from today's funeral. The service started, people stood, and it was silent. Carson's hockey team sat in a row wearing their jerseys, the end chair empty where Carson would have sat, his number 14 jersey draping the chair instead. The emotion was evident as the pastor addressed the questions that have no answers. There simply isn't an answer to why. How are we going to get ahead? How are we going to go on? Then came the stories, stories of his childhood and stories of his school days. Carson had a presence in our building. His energy, volume, and jokes would always indicate his whereabouts, something we grew to love about him. One thread from all of those stories, the laughter, especially from his father. He spoke of their laughter while shooting hoops, while playing video games, while planning the future together. I always say he wants to be a veterinarian. He wanted nothing more than to be a good friend to people. The music filling in when the words fell short. And not only memories, but also messages. Messages to Carson himself. If you're listening, baby, we are so sorry. Carson, if you were here right now, I would just want to give you a big hug and tell you how much I love you and also messages to the community from his mother. I feel that there's a real need for a change to happen in our world, like, so this doesn't happen again to some other child. Her message was echoed outside the walls of the church auditorium. He was so young and he had such like a life ahead of him, it just shouldn't have been taken away. And everyone just wants to show their support and show that it was so messed up and that like, it's gonna make a change. And those messages extended all the way to the skate park behind the school. Every day at sunset, people are drawn here to the makeshift memorial to light candles. Some who knew him. Feels nice to be with him, to see the pictures. Others who didn't know him at all. There's people from all over, all over the, the Lower Mainland who've shown up here to, just to pay their respects. Because this is and Tanya Fletcher joins us now from Langley. There is grief here for sure, Tanya, but also people want those who did, uh, you know, who just watched and took pictures held accountable. Bring us up to date on the police investigation. 
Yeah, as we mentioned, there have been no arrests in this case, but we spoke with Langley RCMP today. They said they've taken more than 40 witness statements in this case, and they've received more than 100 tips in total. The big question is because there was video evidence of what happened is could there be charges? Did anything criminal happen? And RCMP, it's believed they will be using a lot of those social media videos to look through their investigation. They do so say it will take likely a long time, though, and uh, we don't know when those charges uh, could come forward, if at all, Ian. And the police themselves are under investigation for their conduct the night of Carson's death. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's right. So BC's police watchdog is investigating Langley RCMP themselves uh, because we recently learned that the first 911 call came from someone who'd seen one of the Snapchat videos at home. They became concerned. They called 911. And so officers were initially deployed here after that call to the Langley skate park. But they took a look around. They said they didn't see anything. They didn't find Carson. So they left. It was about two hours later, around 10 p.m., that Carson was discovered about 500 meters from here. So the Independent Investigations Office will be uh, investigating now to determine whether police actions or perhaps their inactions might have contributed to Carson's death. Andy Fletcher in Langley this evening. Thank you. So a lot of people have been wondering, how could anyone take pictures of a child in distress, share them, even joke about it? Let's turn to Dr. Shimmy Kang, a psychiatrist here in Vancouver, specializing in children's mental health and the impact of technology. And, and Dr. Kang, in this case, what could the mindset be behind this behavior? You know, Ian, I don't want to minimize the cruelty or impact of this behavior, but we do know that this generation of young people are often living online. Their digital world can take priority to the real wor world. That could be a factor here. Also, it's a very automatic behavior for young people. It's a habit to pull out your phone and, and take photos and pictures and videos. Also, I'm sure part of it was just pure cruelty um, and part of the bullying phenomenon. So I think all of those factor in. And through all of this, uh, an utter lack of empathy, which, which on the one hand, I think we've probably seen through generations, but is something different happening now? We're really concerned about the lack of empathy, I would say, in mental health and in the school system. Um, all humans have a capacity for empathy, but it has to be nurtured. And some simple things like eye contact, looking at people's faces when you talk, real-life conversations. There's also been a change in our community structure. Young people are living more in a bubble, um, less connected to their neighbors and grandparents and cousins and diversity and different types of people. So all of those factor into what we see is a lack of empathy and, and the need for socially emotional learning you know parents and caregivers are watching now and they're looking for some advice uh, what would you say to them you know I had this exact same conversation with my three kids um, I think um, explaining um, the, all the usuals, bullying and empathy, but bringing it really close to home. So talking about um, examples in their own life, where, where are their thoughts, and really start with an open-ended question. And then being quite firm in your expectations as a parent, saying things like, if you see something like this, please speak up and stand up if you think it's safe. If not, call an adult, call the police or an ambulance, giving very firm directions and expectations with that flexibility of um, finding out what's on their mind. Did you get a sense, though, that your kids listen to that message? How do you, how do you make sure that that message resonates? It has to be repetitive. Um, I use the dolphin parent approach. It's authoritative, meaning that you take the place of a parent. Um, you're not a friend, but you're also not pushing it too hard. You're collaborative, uh, repetitive, and also curious to what's happening in their mind. As they get older, um, we have to be less of an authority and more uh, collaborative. But that is the only kind of um, format that we know that works long term. So I really encourage parents to take that stance with their children and really give that guidance. Dr. Shimmy Kang, always nice speaking with you. Thanks. Thank you. The official election campaign is yet to start, but we're already getting a sense of some of the political tactics, like the Liberals circulating long-ago words from Andrew Scheer on social issues like abortion rights and same-sex marriage. A week after not answering questions about that, today Andrew Scheer did. Katie Simpson looks at the message he delivered and how it might land. Andrew Scheer and his team knew this moment would eventually come. The conservative leader was forced to defend past comments on same-sex marriage and abortion, resurrected in pointed liberal attacks led by Justin Trudeau. He's dredging up divisive social issues, trying to distract Canadians from his litany of failures.
Scheer tried to clarify his positions on those issues, though he seemed to leave wiggle room in his answers. He promised not to reopen the abortion debate and predicted no one in his caucus would bring it up either. We will oppose measures to open this, so uh, I am confident that my party, my caucus, uh, understands that. Scheer seemed to have a different tone in the 2017 Conservative leadership race. As leader, I will ensure that each and every one of my MPs is empowered to speak out on issues that are important to them, to vote freely on matters of conscience, and to introduce legislation on behalf of their constituents. It's a sentiment echoed by an anti-abortion group that spoke with Sheer on this issue two years ago. And Andrew did uh, promise that in his interview with us. And not only a free vote for uh, the Conservative caucus, but also including cabinet ministers as well. The Liberals trotted out this video on Twitter earlier in the day to accuse Sheer of cherry-picking his message based on the audience. I think Canadians need to know where their leaders stand on this. Scheer's stand on same-sex marriage was also questioned for the first time since the Liberals circulated his 2005 speech opposing it. The Conservative leader did not go to great lengths to distance himself from his past words. These are arguments that were being put forward by many people who held views on this issue as Canada was about to change a very uh, fundamental, uh, a very important institution in our country. Uh, that issue is settled. We accept that. Answers that didn't satisfy some uh, party faithful. So. And I do think it's a it's a failure of issues management on the part of the Conservatives. On the issue of same-sex marriage, I think what would have uh, helped uh, would have been to hear him say that his own personal views had evolved since 2005. Uh, he didn't say that. And Katie, tonight that story keeps developing. Yeah, Shear's message was so muddled today, Ian, that his team has had to provide two two separate clarifications as to what he, the point he was trying to make. Uh, and that includes that cabinet ministers will not, after all, have a free vote on abortion-related matters. Conservative sources are saying that some candidates are hearing about these issues at the doorstep, and the concern is it's going to under, undermine support from women or scare progressive voters to support Justin Trudeau rather than the Greens or the NDP preventing that progressive vote split that the Conservatives so badly want to see happen. Katie Simpson in Ottawa, thanks. Thanks. As we wait for the election writ to drop, we want to remind you how you can keep tabs on all the latest polls and projections with our CBC poll tracker. These are the latest numbers aggregated by CBC's poll analyst Eric Grenier. As you can see, they show the Liberals just behind the Conservatives. But the latest seat projection gives the Liberals a 33% probability of winning a majority. For the Conservatives, that's 15%. Eric updates the tracker regularly at cbcnews.ca slash poll tracker. A new federal party is now in the mix, and some people don't like what it stands for. Some of those people wearing T-shirts uh, are marking them as supporters of the Canadian Nationalist Party. Some of the people in the confrontation are Pride Week celebrants. Today, the group was officially registered as a federal party, and that means it can receive tax-deductible donations and run candidates in the October election. It collected the 250 signatures required, so Elections Canada had no choice but to give it party status. One anti-hate group plans to reveal the identities behind those signatures. But as Ashley Burke tells us, a former police chief warns that public shaming can be dangerous. We feel that, you know, people shouldn't be able to hide in the shadows. The Canadian Anti-Hate Network wants as many people as possible to know who is supporting a far-right group, one that's under investigation by RCMP for potential hate speech. We should really know who in our neighbourhoods are supporting this uh, in, a, in a really a bit to shame them. Hate has no place in our communities, it has no place in our society, and uh, we need to call it out wherever it is. The group plans to post online the identities of more than 250 members of the Canadian Nationalist Party. The goal, it says, is a peaceful conversation. Maybe someone will actually talk to you and try to explain why hate is not okay and why, you know, we should be in, uh, sort of embracing inclusive communities. As of today, the party's members' names and addresses are on the public record at Elections Canada. The department's bound by law to release that information upon request. You know, our expectation is that people will treat that information responsibly because there is some, some personal information there. The leader of the Canadian Nationalist Party said his members are worried about their safety. 
Some of our members are simply concerned that physical harm may come to them, physical or social harm. The party is under RCMP investigation for possible hate speech because of this video in which the leader denounces what he calls, quote, the parasitic tribe. He says it controls the media and the central bank in Canada. I think it's far too dangerous for us to be taking this action of publicly trying to shame people. Winnipeg's former police chief warns it could lead to serious harm, not just to those on the list, but family members, especially children. I think we probably have seen issues like this in the past, and most definitely it could incite violence because we really don't know what actions a person will take when they're confronted with something like this. Since the Canadian Nationalist Party applied for official status, a number of members have asked Elections Canada to remove their name from the paperwork. Their identities will remain unknown, and the party has retained enough members to meet the requirements. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. That is Hurricane Dorian swirling across the Atlantic tonight, gathering strength as it barrels towards the Bahamas and Florida. Forecasters predict Dorian may hit Florida as a potentially catastrophic Category 4 storm. Donald Trump has cancelled a trip to Poland, saying the hurricane could be a very, very big one. It is still days away, but as Kim Brunhuber tells us, people in Florida are already preparing. Floridians are filling up sandbags. Their cars and their grocery carts. They know it's coming, but they don't know where. Just getting prepared before the storm comes. Dorian, potentially a Category 4 storm. It could bring hurricane-strength winds at over 200 kilometers per hour, 10 to 20 centimeters of rain, and life-threatening storm surges. So far, the storm has been unpredictable, frustrating meteorologists. Puerto Rico got off lightly, but a shift in Dorian's path took the Virgin Islands by surprise. First, the bad news. The National Hurricane Center is predicting the storm will pass over a region with very warm waters and favorable winds, essentially a hurricane amplifier. The good news, there is still time. Forecasters now believe it could hit on Monday. Time to act is now. Uh, if you haven't acted, act to make preparations. Do not wait until it's too late. Dorian would be the first Category 4 storm to make landfall on Florida's east coast since Hurricane Andrew in 1992, which killed 61 people and caused about $27 billion worth of damage. But officials say they're now much better prepared. If, uh, if a storm were to hit Miami-Dade now, we now have new technology. We have drones now that will go out and look at, um, and look at the damage throughout the Miami-Dade County so that we can go ahead and disperse our resources uh, to where the, the, it's actually needed. Officials say it's still too early to order evacuations. They don't know exactly where Dorian will hit or if it will even make landfall at all. But experts say even a modest shift in direction could mean the difference between catastrophic winds and a modest breeze. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. We're also keeping an eye on the Maritimes where post-tropical storm Erin is moving in tonight. This was St. John, New Brunswick earlier. It has been pouring all day and things are expected to get a lot worse. Aaron is expected to bring an additional 40 to 80 millimeters of rain, perhaps more than 100 in some areas. Strong winds up the Atlantic coastline could also lead to downed trees and power outages. And we have some breaking international news that we're watching tonight. It is 1118 Friday morning in Hong Kong, where a prominent activist has reportedly been arrested. Hong Kong leaders just serving the interests of Chinese government be the puppet of Beijing. That is Joshua Wong speaking to us earlier this summer, a longtime figure in Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. And according to fellow pro-democracy activists, he was taken into a van after leaving a subway station. He had only recently finished serving time for his role in protests in 2014. More than 800 people have been arrested in Hong Kong since June when protests began against a controversial extradition bill. We're watching several other domestic stories tonight including one out of Manitoba where a 15-year-old is dead and another is charged with his murder. Police were called to this building in Brandon just before 7 p.m. last night. A teenage boy had been stabbed. He was rushed to hospital but didn't survive. Police arrested another 15-year-old a short time later. Officers say the pair knew each other. And a major recall to tell you about tonight involving Whirlpool, KitchenAid and Gen Air Radiant Heat Cooktops. Health Canada says certain models with touch controls and ceramic glass can turn on without touching them. 
Nearly 3,000 units affected by this recall were sold in Canada since March 2017. You can find the model and serial numbers on the Health Canada website. In health news tonight, many women know the symptoms of menopause can be challenging, and so is choosing the right treatment. Attitudes towards hormone replacement therapy have shifted from enthusiasm to concern and back again for years. But Nicole Ireland shows us there is now new, detailed data on the risks that researchers hope will help women make the best choice for them. The hormonal replacement. Blanca Tovar Verma first came to talk to her family doctor about menopause a year ago. I was one of those uh, women who thought, I can do it on my own. But her hot flashes and night sweats became so intense, she barely got three hours of sleep a night. She had a busy career and loved to travel, but depression and desperation set in as she felt her normally energetic self slipping away. One day I was thinking, who's this person? Who? This is not the, the person I know. This is not the Blanca I know. Six months ago, she and Dr. Iris Gorfinkel decided to try hormone replacement therapy, even though breast cancer was a potential risk. The question ultimately is, how bad are those symptoms? And do those symptoms impact enough negatively in her life to warrant hormonal replacement therapy? Hold your breath. Don't Research findings on hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer have been inconsistent over the decades. So Oxford University scientists combed through years of studies involving more than 100,000 postmenopausal women who had developed breast cancer. Their findings, published in the Lancet Medical Journal, say the formulation of hormones women take matters. About 1 in 50 women who take estrogen and progesterone for five years will get breast cancer. That number decreases to 1 in 70 if they take progesterone less often. And if they take estrogen only, the risk decreases to 1 in 200. Another critical finding, how long women take hormone replacement therapy for, also makes a difference. Increasing duration of use was also associated with a significantly increasing risk of breast cancer. So limiting use to under five years of either formulation would be ideal. Joanne Kutsopoulos wrote a commentary on the Lancet study. Clinicians and, and patients have to work together to really have a frank discussion about their symptoms as they enter menopause. For Dr. Iris Gorfinkel, that's the key. It's not a slam dunk, one answer for everybody. The answer should be a very individualized response. That worked for Blanca Tovar Verma. She's back to her normal self, confident they made the right decision for her. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on The National, Alex Trebek says he's on the mend after being treated for pancreatic cancer. He told us about that treatment in an emotional interview. We'll revisit that in about 10 minutes. But first one, this one is for sniffly city dwellers. It's just miserable. It's like you can't stop sniffling, you can't stop sneezing. It's like, you know, you get the back-to-back -back sneeze. You can't really function, you know. If your seasonal allergies have been particularly bad this year, you're not alone. Lauren Pelly gets into the science of the sinus. We've been looking at the impact of climate change in our series, In Our Backyard. And tonight, that yard is urban. New data revealing pollen levels have risen in several Canadian cities over the past decade. Lauren Pelly shows us why it's happening and what you can do. Runny nose, sneezing, sniffling. It's kind of disorienting. I actually had to call in sick a couple of days at work. It's just miserable. Those seasonal symptoms come from pollen producers like these. Every day we have over 30 cities that we monitor here in Canada. This Ottawa company collects airborne pollen samples. More than a decade of data show the amount is rising in cities across the country, including Ottawa, Montreal, Winnipeg, Toronto and Calgary. It seems to be attributed to uh, several different scenarios, but one could be longer growing season, which we believe is attributed to climate change. Ragweed is one of the plants sticking around. Research shows the growing season is now about a month longer in Winnipeg and Saskatoon. Scientists believe that's caused by rising temperatures. Even worse, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere creates a greenhouse effect, helping each plant produce more pollen. So why are we seeing more pollen and worse allergies in concrete jungles like this, where it feels like 
there's not actually that many plants. We've always thought that if you live in the country, you certainly have, you know, a higher chance of experiencing high pollen levels. But allergists say cities are bigger allergen traps. Tall buildings cut the air currents, and all the concrete means pollen doesn't get stuck when it lands on the ground. One survey also found more than 90% of the trees planted in many Canadian cities are male pollen producers, instead of the female trees that drop seeds and fruit. Only because they tend to make less of a mess and require less care. That means city dwellers are prime candidates for stuffy noses and watery eyes. And if you're wondering what's causing your symptoms... Mind if I draw on your arm? Sure. You can take a skin test. Mine showed allergic reactions to all kinds of pollen. So anything above three millimeters typically is, is considered positive. Right. It's not pleasant, but once you know the answers, your doctor can build a targeted treatment. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on the national, tech startups are booming across the country, mostly. In Alberta, though, investors aren't putting up the bucks. Aaron Collins examines why. But first, big news from Jeopardy! host Alex Trebek. The Canadian says he is, quote, on the mend from pancreatic cancer. It's another day at the office for me and an exciting day because so many great things have been happening. And as we celebrate his good news, we revisit his interview with Rosemary. Next. It's another day at the office for me and an exciting day because so many great things have been happening. Good things indeed. Today, Alex Trebek announced he is back to work and back on that stage. The Jeopardy! host says he's on the mend after completing chemotherapy treatment for pancreatic cancer. Now it's all about looking forward. I'd like to welcome you all to the first day of season 36. So put your hands together. And if this is any indication of what's to come, the 79-year-old isn't showing any signs of slowing down. And he seems ready to ring in new milestones. Rosemary sat down with Alex Trebek in Ottawa shortly after his cancer diagnosis. Tonight, we are revisiting their conversation about his love of learning and why the show must go on. And now, here is the host of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. 35 years and nearly 8,000 episodes, he's been the host of television's favorite quiz show. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. But before he was the man with all the answers, Hello, my name is Trebek. The Sudbury, Ontario native got his start at the CBC in the 1960s, while he was still a philosophy student at the University of Ottawa, becoming a newsreader, sports anchor, hosting music shows, and of course, game shows right here on this network. The question is worth 10 points. I represented St. John in the Canadian House of Commons. Alex Trebek's trademark poise, brain power, and wit have made him into one of the most recognized and respected figures on TV. Back in March, he shared his cancer diagnosis with the world. This week, I was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. All the while comforting millions of fans with his humor and honesty. I plan to beat the low survival rates for this disease because under the terms of my contract, I have to host Jeopardy for three more years. Off camera, Trebek has been a champion of geographic literacy. Alex Trebek has instilled a love of learning in millions of people around the world. Even honored with an Order of Canada for that work. I met up with Alex Trebek at the new Centre for Geography and Exploration. Good to see you. Thank you. Does it feel at all like a homecoming when you come to this city? Always. Because it is my favourite city in Canada. Mm. Uh, I have so many great memories of my time spent here as a boarding student at the University of Ottawa, yeah. then at the university itself, and beginning my career with the CBC for the first two years here in our nation's capital. So yes, it always feels good to come back home, and I've maintained the connection with the university, yeah. and in more recent times, I've developed a relationship with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, so that works in favor of that feeling also. 
so yeah, you, that's why you're here today. So just ex maybe explain to people why that's so important to you. Well, I don't know. When I was growing up, geography was my favorite subject in school. I tell people that it's because I like to color the maps <laughs> and I stayed inside the lines. Doesn't surprise me. But I've always believed that if you know geography, you have a better chance of understanding humanity because you know why different people settled in different areas. You know the development of those countries. You know bound, why boundaries have been established over centuries. And all of that can only work to the benefit of humanity because if I understand where you're coming from, maybe I'll be nicer to you. I won't be quite so mean. Mm. Uh, you, you've talked about your health, and of course that's what most people are thinking about when they see you today. How you're feeling? Feeling tired, uh, but that's okay. The last uh, chemo was three days ago, and it didn't bother me the first day, but then it sort of, for some reason, after a few days, sure. starts to gang up on you. And But that's all right. I mean, it you comes with the territory. You don't look tired. Well, I am. <laughs> Why are you so, um, I don't know, stubborn maybe, or really committed to things like this? You, you've you just had chemo. Why would you just say, oh, forget it, I'm not going to do this, or I'll because take a night I, off from the show? or oh, uh, Unless you're dead, if you made a commitment to an important group, and then an important association, and the RCGS is certainly that. And a lot of people are counting on you. A lot of people are coming here because they expected me to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, unless I'm dead, I'm coming. <laughs> and I arranged to come. And the same thing for the show? There was not any point where you wanted to call in sick? No. No, no I don't do that unless I I'm really can't perform. The only time they had to cancel tapings because of me was on one occasion when I completely lost my voice. But aside from that, I've been there with kidney stones, I've been there right after my heart attacks, mm -hmm. I've been there after dropping a giant jackhammer on my left foot and, <laughs> and hobbling out, so I've... Is that just the way you were raised? Well, I'm Canadian. <laughs> I played hockey. <laughs> Shebang tough. I'm a tough guy. When you decided to release the video about your pancreatic cancer, how, how difficult was that to... Not at all. No. I wanted to stay ahead of the tabloids because I knew they'd be getting involved with all kinds of misinformation. I did not want that to be the way things worked out. So, and I believe in being honest and forthright with the public because I've been in the public eye now for more than half my life. I've had a broadcasting career which has lasted over 55 years. So, yeah. And, and in that uh, video, you, you did talk about the prognosis not, not being great. Right. Now, normally the prognosis for this is not very encouraging, but I'm gonna fight this and I'm gonna keep working and with the love and support of my family and friends and with the help of your prayers also, I plan to beat the low survival rate statistics for this disease. It, was that message as much for you as for people, other people with pancreatic cancer or fighting those well, kinds of things? Well, for both of us, I think, because we never know at the beginning, and I don't know now. I had my last chemo this past week, and I go in for a PET scan uh, day after tomorrow, and then we'll have a better idea as to where things stand. And if we've managed to get rid of some of the tumors, that'll be great, and then I can go to immunotherapy, uh, because they have discovered that my cancer is a specific mutation that responds well mm -hmm. to certain kinds of immunotherapy. So you've, you've got a choice. You can be pessimistic yes. or you can be optimistic. It's a lot better to be optimistic because you stand a better chance of helping to cure yourself. You, uh, you, you have talked about those, some of the, the bleaker moments. Uh, one is depression and sadness. Mm -hmm. Um, is that the first time that you've experienced that kind of looking in the eye of something that you weren't sure you'd be able to? Well, not really, because last year, as I mentioned at the Emmy Awards show, I had uh, brain surgery for two fairly large blood clots on my brain that were life-threatening, and they had compressed the brain down uh, quite a bit, and that was frightening. Uh, that provided me with a certain amount of uh, depression. Mm -hmm because I didn't know what it was. I, I thought I was having uh, the beginnings of a stroke. My mother had just passed away a year and a half earlier from a stroke. 
So that was on my mind, and that scared the daylights out of me. But this, for some reason, the cancer is, hey, so many people get cancer. Mm -hmm. I'm not alone out there. And I want them to feel that they're not alone, that they have somebody uh, who can speak out in public on their behalf and raise their hopes yeah. because that's so important. And I've gotten messages from people all across America, all across Canada, prayers, advice. I've had so many masses said on uh, my behalf. Does that surprise you that there, there would be this kind of outreach? It did to a certain extent, really? but there are a lot of really nice people out there, <laughs> so it no longer surprises me. Has there been a message that has been particularly touching or resonated with you in a different way? Just uh, to have a strong belief in a superior being and leave it in his or her hands. You, you've also talked about some of the pain associated with this and yeah. how you were taping during yeah. the pain. And I'm Canadian too, listen, but I don't, I, I'm a bit of a wuss, I guess, compared to you. I would just call it quits. And you, you went through that pain. Well, once you understand where the pain is coming from and what its limitations are, and as I indicated in one interview, those spasms usually last 10 to 15 minutes. And, but this was different. This was a stomach spasm, and my stomach just got very firm, and I said, oh, gosh, that ball inside the stomach has uh, cracked or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, that's going to be a serious problem. But then it went away, so I said, oh, okay, let's do it. I, I was reading some of the articles that came out after your, uh, after your diagnosis and after your video, and there were so many people, so many famous people, and so many regular people who feel like you are this part of their, I mean, even the Prime Minister just said it, how he grew up uh, watching it with his dad. Those of you who remember my father might know that he wasn't a big fan of his kids watching television. Indeed, uh, we got about a half hour a week in general, except one exception was made, that when we got home from school, we were allowed to watch Jeopardy. How oh, you were such a big part of their lives. Do you feel that? Well, you... yes, now I do, because keep in mind, I've been doing this show for 35 years. I've been in your home every evening for 35 years, if you're a loyal fan. Yeah. And uh, yes, and it has taken me by surprise the extent to which the show has been a factor in the lives of Canadians and Americans, yeah. and by extension, how I also have become a part of their lives. So. It's all good. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> what is happening with the show now? Because there's this. We're on hiatus. Yeah, but there's but this the guy who's doing great. The teachers' yeah. tournament yeah. is on. Jeopardy! James yes. will return this coming Monday. You have just set a one-day record again. 131. And uh, we'll see what happens. Oh, interesting. And you think he's good because he's a gambler or because he's just very smart? I think he's good because he's smart. Yeah. He's yeah. bright as all get out. How do you think you would do if you were a contestant? I'm 78 years old. Yeah, but you can't tell. Yeah. Yes, yes, you can. My wife can tell. I can tell. Yeah. You'd still do okay, though. Against my peers. Yes. You, do you still love it after all these years? Absolutely. Yeah. It's the best kind of job for somebody like me. I've been uh, very lucky in my career, uh, throughout my career. I've gone from one show to another show. Even shows that didn't succeed helped me and they all prepared me for the show that many people feel I was destined to host. And if that's the case, hey, good. Well, it's a thrill to meet you. And Thank you. I wish you, uh, I wish you good health. Okay, appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Richard. All right. So you heard them talk about Jeopardy James. Well, the professional sports gambler did eventually lose after a record-breaking 32-game winning streak, bringing home close to $2.5 million. Today, he tweeted about Trebek's return, saying, see you soon, eh? Still ahead on The National, you've heard the one about the cat coming back? How about the pig? When that pig showed up, it was almost like a kiss from heaven. The adventures of Ellie in our moment. I'm Chris Berube, filling in for Jamie Poisson tomorrow on the CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, a profile of the new Bloc Québécois leader, Yves-Francois Blanchette, who takes over the party after years of turmoil. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.
Welcome back to The National. We're tracking some developing stories, beginning with another day of protest in the UK. We will be back in Parliament on Tuesday to challenge Boris Johnson on what I think is a smash-and-grab raid against our democracy. The protests against a planned suspension of Parliament continued across the country today. Demonstrators are angry at the Prime Minister for what they say is a move to prevent MPs from blocking a no-deal Brexit. An online petition aimed at making sure that doesn't happen has already topped a million signatures. With that level of support, a date will now be set for Parliament to consider the issue. In the United States, the Trump administration is moving to reverse federal rules on methane emissions from the oil and gas industry. Barack Obama's White House had targeted new fracking operations. The Environmental Protection Agency estimates that energy companies will save more than $100 million over five years. Environmental groups say they plan to challenge the proposal in court. I always say if there's a great entrepreneur and a great idea, the capital will flow to it. Well, according to industry experts, venture capital is flowing to Canadian startups, high risk, high reward, and often high tech. It's the kind of money that can reshape economies. But where's it going? Well, the new report shows Ontario and Quebec get the lion's share. That's followed by BC, Saskatchewan, and Nova Scotia getting significantly less. And then finally, Alberta. With more than four times Nova Scotia's population, Alberta brings in even less investment urbanized with solid infrastructure and skilled workers, you'd think Alberta should be tapping into more of that cash. Erin Collins explores why, so far, it isn't. It's often the little things that can lead to big bucks in the world of tech. Well, this is kind of the, the secret sauce that makes it all happen. In this case, a tiny speaker used to track things inside virtual reality video games or on an automotive assembly line. We've got a little demo process here that I'm going to make you do for the first okay. time ever. All right, <laughs> I'm going to learn how to build a car here. Lowe says he has buyers for his invention, but long before that, he needed yes. investors. Not an easy get for a tech startup in Canada's energy capital. It's always a challenge. Uh, obviously, Calgary is not world-renowned for its tech industry, uh, although it's changing. Alberta companies are way behind those in other provinces when it comes to investment in startups. Entrepreneurs here bagged just $25 million in the first half of this year. Surprising given the province's entrepreneurial DNA. And the risk factor of the highs and lows of that economy, that population is not risk averse. Not afraid, but perhaps a little gun shy. The energy downturn hit hard here, leaving a quarter of the offices in Calgary's downtown empty. Those in the know say it's not surprising that traditional energy investors here are easing in to tech. This town is built on really smart people who figured out how to create dollars from energy. And the re-education and re-emergence of the new asset class called tech is tough. Up the road in Edmonton, there's a push to get more help for the sector, specifically reinstating an NDP tax credit for investors frozen by the new Conservative government, a credit some startups say they can't survive without. There was a discussion as to whether we would move to Silicon Valley, um, and it's a step I don't want to take. I have family here, I love the city, I grew up in this city but I need my business to succeed. Well, the province hasn't decided what to do about the tax credit, but one thing is certain, filling Calgary's towers with tech workers won't come cheap. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Next on The National, a pig that spent two months on the lamb makes her emotional return home. And right away, my husband said, I bet that's Ellie. And then he said, Bonnie, it is Ellie. And I come out of the kitchen and sure enough stood there and there she was. The dramatic tale of Ellie the pig is next. This is Ellie at 200 pounds. She is no ordinary pet. So after two months on the lamb, her owners feared the worst, but this week came some good news. Turns out Ellie found her way back home. Her owner, Bonnie Weaver, tells us about that in our moment. Now you gotta sit. You gotta sit. Sit. When that pig showed up, it was almost like a kiss from heaven, you know. We were away for a family funeral, and while we were gone, 
um, my foster brother called us and he said, Bon, we haven't seen the pig for a couple of days. I always would look to see if she would be in her favorite spots, but um, after two months and that wasn't there, we just thought, I hope if she is dead, I hope she didn't suffer. Our horses started reacting to something in the pasture, which they do if there's a deer or a moose just passing through. And right away, my husband said, I bet that's Ellie. And then he said, Bonnie, it is Ellie. And I come out of the kitchen and sure enough stood there and there she was coming up through the pasture with six horses all around her. And uh, I went down and vocal, like it, it was like, where have you been and where have I been? In the process, she did lose about 30 pounds, which that was good for her because she was so heavy and overweight that, you know, she could hardly see out of her eyes. Hey. Oh. Hey, how are you? So she's just back on her old routine, and where she's laying right now is lots of times in the sun. That's where she loves to be. Okay, bite it. Bite it. There. It's not exactly fair that we're doing this moment without any of the co-hosts here. There's so much we could talk about. This pig's parents, apparently 30 to 40 pounds. This pig is 200 pounds. It figured out how to get bread from a tamper-proof bread box. It believes it's a dog. There's so much more in the notes here, but we'll just leave it at that because that is The National for Thursday, August 29th. Good night.